Hello, and welcome to the data art series of webinars on trend, technology, and thought leadership. Today's webinar, titled Business or Leisure, How to Use Artificial Intelligence and Automation to Better Understand Your Traveler, together with our partner, Unifor, the conversational AI and automation platform, we will focus on challenges on, of determining a traveler's profile, business, leisure, or hybrid. And how can we, uh, um, how can the development of the new AI uh, technology support uh, businesses and increase customer satisfaction? Please welcome our moderator. And that will be me, Max Donov, VP of Travel, Transportation and Hospitality Data Art. Um, let me introduce our esteemed speakers. Gianna Riviera, Travel uh, Distribution Consultant, former Global Vice President at, at Wyndham. Hello, um, uh, thank you so much for having me here. I'm Gianna Rivera, as Max just uh, mentioned, and I'm the principal consultant owner for Travel Distribution Consultant, currently providing consulting services to um, travel technologists and hoteliers alike on best practices regarding distribution and digital um, and, and dig di digitalization in today's environment. Thank you again for having me here. Thanks for coming, Gianna. Um, next uh, speaker is John Heimick. Uh, VP of uh, and, and Chief Economist of Airlines for America. Uh, pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Max and Gianna. Thank you, John. Um, next speaker is Mark Pulliam, Head of Business Development and at Travel and Hospitality at Unifor. Hi, Max, John, Gianna. Uh, I'm really excited about today's conversation. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming, Mark. And Stan Boyer, Airline Industry Advisor. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks, Max, and uh, great to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much. So um, in these days, everybody's talking about travel. Um, so, um, you know, after um, specifically after COVID, after 2020, the world has changed. And the last time I remember I've been to New York uh, in 2020, it was March, um, March the 7th, and then every ev ev everything that um, happened after was just, you know, just a nightmare. Um, everything closed, and I didn't see uh, Manhattan that, that empty uh, compared to all the prior times I've been there. What is the state of, of the um, recovery right now? And I'm going to start with you, John. So what, you know, as, as a... Uh, airline industry uh, specialist. So what can you tell us about the industry recovery in airline industry? Well, on the demand side, it's, uh, it's steadily improving. Uh, <clears throat> we have strong traffic demand, particularly with respect to leisure and visiting friends and relatives. I think small and medium businesses next where we're lagging. There's still large corporations that plateaued a bit at 30% below ticket sales pre-pandemic. Um, some parts of the Latin America are strong internationally. Canada's picking up nicely. We, Europe's coming along, especially for the summer. We still see long haul and particularly uh, Asia uh, lagging. And unfortunately, we have high expenses as many industries throughout and households throughout the economy are facing. But in terms of uh, air travel demand, uh, that seems to be quite strong at the moment. And for some segments of the clientele, it's actually exceeding pre-pandemic strength. Okay, so um, uh, I know that you prepared some some materials. Um, so uh, can you just uh, 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 point us to the right uh, information and data points there? Sure. Let's just go to the next slide here, and uh, <clears throat> I'll walk you through a few of these for background. Uh, this is for our member carriers uh, listed at the bottom here, Alaska, American, Delta, Hawaiian, JetBlue, Southwest United, and their uh, regional airline partners. Uh, what this really shows you is the uh, change in passengers rel by region relative to pre-pandemic. So our members are carrying more passengers to and from uh, Mexico, for example, in that orange line than they were pre-pandemic. Next uh, area is the rest of Latin America and domestic US. And you can really see how that transatlantic strength 
uh, which is not just Europe, by the way, it's some parts of Middle East and Africa and some other areas, uh, perhaps Turkey, uh, that have picked up nicely and accelerated after November 8th when the Biden administration relaxed its inbound travel restrictions. We're still, of course, got the pre-departure uh, testing requirement, but uh, the transatlantic is almost caught up with where the uh, U.S. is, uh, domestic U.S. is now. Uh, right behind that is uh, Canada still down about 40% volumes, transborder, and then the Pacific clearly lagging, which is Asia and South Pacific, Australia, New Zealand, Tahiti and such. Uh, next slide. Uh, so to peel the onion on international a bit, this is flown traffic by all U.S. and foreign carriers between the United States and the top 20 foreign countries as they were in April 2019. So for example, US Canada was the busiest nonstop air travel corridor with the US uh, four years ago, eight, sorry, three years ago, April. And that remained 42%. Uh, so that sort of lines up with the previous chart. Uh, and then UK and Germany, what really stands out here uh, on the negative side are US Japan down 78% past year volume. Again, this is all April as flown, not as not sales for the future, but flown in the month of April. China down, uh, and Hong Kong down 98, 99%. And of course, those countries are still very locked down. South Korea down 67%. What, what stands positively in contrast is we see increases, US Mexico, US Dominican Republic, US Colombia. Next slide. Ticket sales going forward, this is again, all carriers, uh, tickets booked through US travel agencies for domestic and abroad. Again, here, what's interesting is the international ticket sales uh, actually have overtaken domestic with respect to their uh, relationship to 2019. Overall, ticket sales are, are down uh, about 9% still, uh, but international is down 5%, whereas domestic is down 10. And that, that tends to be tracking we're looking at a, a fairly strong summer for most international, we think. Next slide. Uh, corporate, as I said, has plateaued the last, uh, I think, six or so, eight weeks, I guess, uh, down about 38% from pre-pandemic levels. This is booked through corporate travel agencies. In the United States, we had a long period there in 2020 when we were down close to 90%. And then we saw a steady, uh, incline and then at the beginning of this year post omicron we saw uh, a really nice pickup until about eight weeks ago where we leveled off to about down 31 percent uh, i'm sure you're aware that some large corporations including some tech companies out west have delayed their return to office for their employees and we find generally a high correlation between return to office and return to the skies next slide Okay, so in terms of who is growing among U.S. carriers, if you look at the 10 largest brands, uh, it, is, it is still the Allegiant and Spirit, the ultra low cost carriers that tend to be uh, growing the fastest. That will be true again with this summer, uh, although Hawaiian shows some growth as well. This is defined as June 1st through August 31st relative to that same period in 2019. Uh, the airlines that tend to be uh, either have uh, some staffing challenges or are most dependent on corporate and or Pacific traffic, United Alaska, American Delta, are the ones that are showing the smallest capacity footprint relative to uh, three years ago, JetBlue and Southwest down one to 2%. Next slide. Uh, as I said earlier, jet fuel prices among others have been a headwind in uh real terms uh may is shaping up to be the i think the second highest ever that's an inflation adjusted basis relative to july 2008. uh if we're not adjusting for inflation it would be an all-time high and then you saw recently what happened on a national average basis daily we hit four dollars and 85 cents uh we had seen prices in new york harbor exceeding seven dollars uh, a gallon with the conflict in ukraine and diesel, really refineries running max diesel and exporting a lot to Europe with little low jet inventories in the Northeast. Most of the Eastern seaboard, uh, that's starting to equalize a bit. Uh, that's it for my section. Back to you, Max. Thank you. Thank you, John. So Mark, you, you are your expert in uh, in travel and, and uh, do you, can you comment on, on that airline traffic recovery? 
Well, I think that it's uh, you know fascinating to think about that mm -hmm. on the hotel side, you know, we're seeing mm -hmm. like domestically at least uh, room occupancy that's surpassing potentially 2019 pre-pandemic. And what is driving what is driving that occupancy when you you know John's statement that you see return to office correlates with the return to corporate bookings, but really, is that travel truly completely leisure, or now are we seeing um, more more business being conducted um, that's not going through the corporate travel agency? I think that's the fundamental question: is how well do we know um, the guests that are traveling? And is truly the spike in the low cost carriers that have traditionally been uh, leisure focused, is that really remaining leisure traffic or is it a bigger mix of, of corporate? I think that's the question we're trying to answer. Yes, I, I think that this is exact point that uh, I wanted to uh, zoom in a little bit later in the, in, in the webinar. But uh, Gianna, do you see uh, the same correlation as just Mark mentioned between airlines and you know some some destinations they are action benefiting from higher occupancy yes i definitely see that i think there is um a very different pattern that has followed since the pandemic in the hospitality realm and a lot of different dependencies um would impact how you would you know see the outcome of the performance of those hotels so you know segmentation hotel segmentation is one of those um we did see a difference in those hotels that don't have a quite a, a large dependency on air travel do very well during the pandemic and they continue to do so, right? So the drive market, if you will, was one that expanded and there were over, over the period of, of the pandemic and still today, you'll see there's been an expansion even of, of the number of um, hours and the the radius by which uh, travelers are looking and, and are willing and, and feel safe, if you will, expanding um, their destinations. So a bit, very big uh, performance difference between um, domestic within the regions um, and also drive market as opposed to uh, fly market, if you will, and um, and uh, and definitely an, an increase, I would say, in some of the in some of the markets of ADR that has that we've seen. So historically, I think the way that we've looked at the we've looked at um, things and we looked at we've looked at performance and how travelers are actually searching and booking hotels has changed drastically. And, and that big question that Max, you're gonna look to explore a little bit in more detail here soon of whether it's a leisure traveler or a corporate traveler is to be determined, right? There's so many unknowns that I think it's not that clear anymore. Right, so profile has changed, right? So um, Stan, um, can you just comment on, on um, how it's important for the industry to understand the profile of the customer or you know in general sense is it a business or leisure customer sure i think that that I'll, I'll start from an airline perspective obviously from an airline perspective loyalty programs are built around the corporate customer and as this uh, profile is changing and what we may see is somebody taking uh, a family member or multiple family members with them on a trip, they may not be in the same booking uh, or order, but the, the corporate traveler has an expectation that they will be able to uh, treat their guest as uh, they would themselves uh, in, for a corporate trip. And I think it's uh, difficult for the airlines uh, to pair those up. It's certainly very difficult to add somebody uh, into uh, a booking. Um, linking bookings can be done. Um, again, that requires a phone call right to the airline. From a hotel perspective, I think what changes is how the hotel lays out everything from its lobby uh, to the types of services that the hotel offers. So uh, you may have uh, where they get to the destination and then the corporate traveler has to do some business but the family decides to go off and do something for the day well the corporate traveler may not want to sit in the room all day so they may want to sit down in the lobby area or a lounge area and work which necessitates uh, more plugs for uh, laptop computers uh, 
quiet areas away from mobile phones. It also, uh, I think, and Mark, you and I have talked about this as well. I think we all have that, that the services that are required, right, to keep that lobby functioning um, as both a lobby, but also as a workspace, uh, change the dynamics within the hotel. And I would add stand to that, maybe even um, some of the uh, ballrooms, right? So right. the ballrooms um, that have been repurposed um, are in the or are in the process of being repurposed for just different types of demands from the consumer that that the leisure consumer, if you will. Right, and it could even go so far as to how does it change potential menus? So uh, for for snacks, right? So is the is the person at the hotel a day forced to? order out via Uber Eats or DoorDash, or is the hotel going to provide some ready-made uh, snacks throughout the day? Uh, maybe not a full service um, restaurant uh, concept, but something, um, and I hesitate to call it a buffet, uh, because that still probably isn't out there yet, but uh, um, the ability to, to self-service for those that are remaining at the hotel. And, and Gianna, to this point, so do you have any um, like reflections in terms of like how they share like typical business, typical leisure, and then this new business leisure? Like how was the proportion of those pillars of customers? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, to the point that Stan made earlier, some of the demands that are coming through are just not necessarily being um, um, presented. Um, to the to the consumer, and I think that some of the challenges that hotels are facing in this space right now is the ability to to do so. Right in this digital world, um, you know, Stan, you made the comment of you know um, families traveling together. Uh, the, a very common theme is you know wanting rooms that are uh, connected, right, because they're mm -hmm. traveling with their children or they're traveling with their in laws, and that in the in the in the the ecosystem of distribution as it stands today is not necessarily something that's easily done. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, then it provides opportunity for, um, for you know, for third party providers in the, in the ecosystem to, to um, you know, optimize the opportunity for merchandising and, you know, perhaps creating a bigger challenge for hoteliers to be able to provide these services on brand.com. Um, I, I'd say that's a, that's a big impact. And, and again, that's just one, one, one example, but to Stan's point, there are other opportunities within, you know, services around the hotel or even um, outdoor activities that, you know, um, uh, uh, travelers are looking for that want to know that this is something they can get at the hotel um, prior to actually, you know, uh, deciding to come stay at your property. Right. And, and I think there was one that I forgot to mention. I know we've talked about this one is that with with so many travelers now potentially sitting in these public areas when they want to take a break or they want to walk outside or they to take a phone call or whatever, what do they do with uh, their computer? Right. Do they run it back up to the room or, you know, is there an opportunity for hoteliers to put in um, small lockers or something where people can store things uh, as they're uh, adapting uh, to this new travel environment. Yeah, and I would also add that this kind of leisure trip is not unique to an individual traveler either. Um, we've seen there is a trend of um, corporate, you know, corporate uh, groups, um, you know, coming together to a space in lieu of going to the traditional office space for an in-person meeting um, to, to, to take, you know, to do dual roles, if you will, and it's have the chance to meet in person, but also have an activity uh, as, a, or as a group um, within that same location. So hoteliers are having to look at these types of activities beyond just the individual traveler um, and, and have an opportunity to reach that corporate group travel, if you will, um, that is also demanding new types of activities. So so this is essentially about how to market, um, how to organize services around those different pillars of, of customers, how to optimize your operation and save some cost and you know redeploy the, the, the this cost to potentially other cohorts. So um, but how to understand what you know who is the who is the customer? Is it business or is it a leisure customer or is it a group like, you know, and, and there is potentially one business person appearing, but there is, you know, 
a bunch of other people, you know, spores and then a couple of kids coming on a separate itinerary. So, and, and what are the tools to understand that? And I would, I would ask Mark for that. No, I think that is a, a great segue, Max, because clearly we simply can't rely on the algorithms of the past and the mix of corporate versus leisure agents uh, bookings to try to understand the customer. And here's what AI can do. And this is what you know I love about my job, I really do, is that I can help companies, specifically in travel and hospitality, have better conversations with their customers using artificial intelligence. And when I talk about conversation, I'm talking about all forms of communication. So that's on the, you know, across the customer journey. That's on intelligent chat box, that's IVR, that's uh, when they're talking with a live agent and providing agent guidance. It's after call work, managing the process, uh, promises that may have been made and how do you follow up. So if you're able to, to understand all those conversations at enterprise level and if you're able to free up the agent for instance who's having a conversation just as an example with a guest or a passenger um, and using ai to to transcribe what's happening uh, in real time to prompt the agent on what needs to happen next to actually kick off the next step so the agent isn't on the keyboard an agent can now start asking questions about Hey, by the way, um, you know, are you traveling strictly for business or do you have family joining you? If yes, uh, do you need some uh, recommendations on family friendly hotels if you or family friendly uh, restaurants? Um, if you think about uh, FAQs held at the property level, if you're now able that knowledge, if you're able to capture all that knowledge and see how your customers are interacting with it, you begin to form a picture and a much more detailed customer profile of what that individual traveler needs and what he's traveling for. And so the question that you ask, the analytics on the back end, you know, don't have to necessarily be indexed. It can be natural language. Like, hey, how many, you know, between, you know, such and such date, how many people ask the, you know, how many uh, agents ask the question about, you know, are they traveling with family? What was our response? And you can begin to hone in and get very personalized in your offer and your marketing and understand who is traveling to your guests or who's flying on your airplanes or who's, using your uh, travel agency. So it's a fantastic opportunity, I believe. And in particular, I know John didn't, he hinted at you know, the, the expense burden that a lot of the um, uh, airlines, and this also applies to hotels as well, have um, in staffing and trying to meet back this demand. Companies are already actively looking at artificial intelligence. And so we have to be smart about and have the conversation about how now can I leverage this conversation that's having across the enterprise and what can I discern from it? Because the capabilities are there and the time to value now is very short. Right. So, but can you just give us um, uh, just, you know, a couple of, or, you know, one example of, uh, of uh, such, um, such usage of artificial intelligence, like, you know, potentially if you can, you know, avoid giving some, you know, names, but just give us, uh, like a shape of this engagement, what does it look like? And, and you know, what, what in the end, how the, you know, this artificial intelligence and data were used? Sure. Um, let's, let's think about Vegas and, and gaming and our luxury um, gaming um, uh, resorts. So high value guests and customers typically are assigned a live person, a hostess, right? To take care of their every need, to get them where they need to be, to answer their questions, right? To, to improve that experience. With, you know, an intelligent virtual agent now, you can go to that next tier of customer to a broader breadth of, of, um, of, your, of your guests, uh, of your gaming customers. And now you begin to learn a lot about them. You're helping them get restaurants. They, I mean, you, you, you know, Vegas isn't just about pleasure. Vegas is also a place to do business. And I'd be willing to bet there's a lot of business and pleasure going on in Vegas and family, family time as well. Through the use of an intelligent virtual agent, every single interaction, uh, what kind of, you know, restaurant do you need to not, do you need, does it need to be family friendly? What type of entertainment do you need? You can now scale that and you can learn while they're traveling. You can even begin to, to you know, make those reservations for them and make their, their return flights if they need to as well, all done with a virtual agent. So that's that's one example of how you get to know those customers better. 
And, and I, if I if I may, Max, I think that you know when I think about artificial intelligence and how um, Mark, you've explained how your product worked. I, works. I think that it's really a huge opportunity for hoteliers to be able to use a tool like this to anticipate the, the demands of the consumer, right? And we're living in a time where people want to, um, you know, at the click of a button, they want to be able to do, ask, or, you know, receive, or book, or see, or whatever their action is, um, without having to either have an inter an, a human interaction or have limited li human interaction, or at least have the option to to decide when and, and how, right? So I think that the possibilities are endless um, for hoteliers to to be able to anticipate and um, and adequately um, uh, you know decide where their staffing needs to be based on these needs because staffing, let's face it, is a, is a huge issue for hoteliers today, um, and it's something that you know they're dealing with on a daily basis. Um, as they're trying to also, um, uh, um, you know, work with and balance the the demand, right, of just you know people coming to their hotels and uh, having it able to provide the services that they, that are required or needed, um, basic services and, and uh, services that are needed and required at, a, at to running for running a hotel. Yes, and uh, off top of your mind, do you have any any examples of uh, such aspirations from um, big? hotel names or any, you know, already something that was put in motion? Yeah, I don't have any examples. I do know that there are hotel companies out there that are aspiring to be able to anticipate some of these needs. And there's been a big uh, pent up, you know, um, uh, demand, if you will, on this types of, of services. So the, 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 you know, hotel companies are looking and anticipating not only at CRM services, but just how does the digital, how does that translate into the digital platforms that they're building um, together? And it, so I think that, you know, it's twofold. There are these large hotel chains that are anticipating that, you know, there's something that needs to get done because there's a huge transformation, um, looking to partnerships to help them do that. And there's also um, the independent hoteliers that are doing the same thing. They're looking at their technology stack, real, you know, reviewing and realizing I need to do something different in order to capture this business, right? Um, you know, everyone was looking at, especially those hotels that are uh, more dependent on air travel that, and uh, therefore more dependent on, on business coming from the GDSs. It's coming back, you know, we're seeing that, but um, it took a little while. Um, and so, you know, that required hoteliers to be creative, to, to find ways to, to create the demand back to the, to the hotels. Yeah, be creative. So, so this is very interesting. Uh, so, John and Stan, so can you just a little bit um, unlock this um, uh, this uh, the channels? What what kind of information and what kind of channels airlines might use to get this information to understand? Um, so we all understand that there, there is a tremendous opportunity. We talked a little bit from from hotelier perspective, but what is the information? How someone can understand uh is it business or leisure or this is be leisure or probably get into more details about the you know needs of a particular traveler yeah well they can do something radical and ask them <laughs> um you know right. but when, we're talking about automation and artificial intelligence so right well so, when when yeah. i uh all people always tell me you know ask me questions even even in my own organization about mm -hmm. how much is this is business and how much is leisure or whatever. And I explain, well, when you travel, do you tell the airline why you're flying? No. Well, then how would they know? Well, they don't know. They make educated guesses based on the type of ticket you bought or if you bought under an agency code or what distribution channel you bought for or corporate volume agreement or can I just be more specific here? Because I, I think audience are, are looking to understand what are these specific features to understand, just distinguish the pattern. Well, I mean, for, for example, if you, if you just like a retail store or something, if you, if you expect full refundability at Nordstrom, there's a difference between Nordstrom and Nordstrom Rack, right? And uh, you make a trade, I will accept a lower price for my good or service in return for more restrictions. We see that with hotels, with Greyhound bus, with Amtrak, whatever it is. Um, there are often three or four fair categories and the more restrictive in terms of your ability to change the product or 
get a full refund, you're going to different price and you make an economic trade with the service provider or the good provider. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes uh, even when I travel for business, I'll make that trade. Well, I could get a slightly ho cheaper hotel rate uh, if I accept uh, no refund. Do I want to take that gamble? And uh, right. all, all these sorts of things. And it's no different for the airlines. Uh, it, but it, it's uh, and then it's also the distribution channel. Generally speaking, uh, I'm not going to book a, a personal trip through a corporate travel agency. And the airline knows that, especially uh, if they say it involves uh, a Saturday night stay and whatnot. Now, with the way fares have changed, um, that's getting harder to uh, fares have changed for the better in a way that makes it harder to identify some of these things because now it's much easier to buy one way tickets uh, for a normal price and often on two separate airlines. That's the key part, two separate air. Someone might fly Southwest in one direction and Delta in another direction on a trip, or they'll do a, a three-way trip uh, for business where they fly uh, multi-leg and, and some of those are harder to uh, determine or they'll even uh, drive a car for, for an open leg and then connect the two air <clears throat> trips. So these things are less clear than they used to be. And often when I book now a hotel, rent a car, Amtrak, whatever, should that be the case, uh, it's often the case they will say, are you traveling for business or personal reasons? And in an electronic matter, uh, manner with a simple yes, no, or other or something, I'm, I'm generally inclined to answer it and to answer it truthfully. I mean, that's the other thing, right, with surveys is it's one thing to answer the question. It's another thing to do so truthfully. Like, oh, if I, if I check this box, are they going to treat me in a way that I don't think is fair? But... Uh, and sometimes the company will throw in sweeteners, right? If, if you answer this question, you're eligible for some prize or it helps us refine our offers to you or uh, there's some bonus, what, whatever. But I think in this day and age, people are getting more and more used to the idea of sharing more information with folks uh, with as long as there's a perception that they're getting something for it. And, you know, we... None of us really, when, when I get a survey in the mail of any kind, you know, it could be about anything. One of the first things I look at is how long is it and can I fill it out online? So um, with online, I think it's just much easier to do something you might not have wanted. Because, you know, you fill out these circles and then you spill something on it and then you got you got to find a mailbox and all online it's boom 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 and and uh it's often clear like if you you know on paper you have to say well if you answered no you can skip to this section and sometimes with automation it, it does that for you right you answer a certain way you know so it ends up taking less time even for the same number of questions when you do online so i i'm suggesting that this is something you know airlines could do more and more people are engaging not just in formal surveys, but at the time, at the point of sale, uh, through Twitter uh, exchanges for customer service interactions, uh, you know, and in separate just promotion. So, and, and you know, it's none of this stuff has to be 100%. You can sample to get an idea. And to Mark's point earlier, I think he's right. You know, people are, uh, it's becoming harder to identify people simply by their distribution channels. So we can kind of tease out so that behavior, we can even tease it out in just a particular distribution channel and, right. and I'm, as a starter. So sorry for the long answer, but I, I think there are ways to do it where people are more willing to share that kind of information over time. So Yes. yes. If, I could, if I could add, Max, I think from a, from a hotelier perspective, I think it's a little bit harder. Well, first of all, I want to say that the distinction between um, whether someone's traveling for business or leisure being the, the type, the difference in um, the, the terms and conditions of the rate they booked, that sort of has kind of, you know, um, um, that opportunity has has really shortened, if you will, because there's not that much of a difference anymore, right, between the re very restrictive rate um, versus uh, one that's a little bit less restrictive. Since, since um, COVID-19, I think we've 
you know, hoteliers have had to be more 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 flexible um, in their rate um, in their revenue management strategies, mm -hmm. and so it's hard to make that distinction there. Um, and then the other thing mm -hmm. is we're seeing that technology has um, expanded, it's particularly in the corporate travel space. Um, and there's a lot of spillage, if you will, in benefits for uh, employees as they become more leisure oriented to be able to book, you know, leisure travel within their, you know, business travel. So again, this segmentation of how the reservations are coming through, it's also a little blurry. It's, it doesn't, you know, tell us enough. And then the last point I'll make is that from a hospitality perspective, often those channels, even though they do ask the question uh, more often than not, that data is not necessarily shared to your point, John, right? Um, so from a hotel's perspective, they don't necessarily have that information being shared by a third party. So unless they've asked the question within the the um, their own environment on brand.com, uh, which obviously most of them already do, the question then is, if you're asking that question, how is that um, being used um, and compared? And, and, and is it compared because you know you can't really, you're not getting that information from third parties. So it's really segregated. It's very fragment, fragmented. It's very hard to tell the story. Right. And I, I think it, it makes the, the, the whole case even, even harder to understand if you don't have a you know, clear information coming from the user direct from the trailer directly, and uh, you don't have the opportunity to ask, uh, and and uh, or you know, traveler might not be willing to share. So, Stan, um, um, so can you think about any kind of limitations to um, uh, to the how information might be shared across the channels? I'm talking specifically about the silos because we talk about, okay, so we have that information. We, we can ask the user, we can ask this and that, we can, you know, get this, you know, right. booking window, we can, you know, see the destination. But what are the limitations? Because everybody knows that travel is, is so fragmented. Yeah, I think so. If I look at managed corporate travel first, right, most of the airlines and the corporations have some sort of an agreement where they have some sort of a corporate identifier uh, that gets associated with their travel. The same for hoteliers. Unfortunately, those are all different across every single uh, provider that's out there. And so, uh, and a corporation doesn't necessarily make that information known to its travelers, which could be very helpful when, for instance, somebody shows up and they say you're traveling on business or leisure and you say business and my corporate ID is X, right? Uh, but that information stays in the background and, and it doesn't get shared. So it's really left for uh, someone at the airline to analyze or uh, artificial intelligence to pick that up and then to try to do some more linking. So I talked about earlier, right? If I'm traveling with my family and to Gianna's point, right, some corporations are allowing uh, their travelers to book their families uh, using the corporate booking tool. Um, great idea. Some travelers will be reticent to do that uh, because they don't necessarily want the corporation right into their family business uh, as they're traveling. So again, another, I'll call it a wall, uh, gets put up. Uh, but um, with the ability to use AI to, to look at um, as you described, Max, even destinations and things like that, and actually get down to the specific travelers who are traveling and try and link the travelers together themselves, right? That's one way to begin to overcome uh, that wall. Um, again, that would, there are a lot of legalities probably around that. And so uh, it really goes back to a simple question of, of asking, right? So for instance, it's easier to add people to your hotel reservation than it is to an air reservation. And so where they might check in at a hotel and the hotelier says, you know, are you, how many room keys do you need? And you say, well, I need four because I'm adding three people uh, to my room. Well, that information uh, would never be shared back, right? With the other right. travel providers, uh, mainly because uh, the travelers in control of that. And I think that, We've talked about this for a long time that um, 
travel providers need to really agree that the traveler is the owner of the traveler information and uh, getting them to share that uh, in some way uh, that makes it useful is key. Yes. And Dan, if that's a great point. And yes. as you said that, I was thinking, really, it depends um, on who that front desk agent is, as opposed to what will they do with that information, right? So now, you know, you have the guest has checked in, you anticipated one person, they're asking for, for three more keys. Um, the question would be, what is that agent at the front desk going to do with that information? Are they going to do anything with it? Will they input it into the system? Will this system that they input the information in, is that a system that talks to any other system that will capture the data, the, you know, intelligently to be able to, you know, make something that's merchandisable in the future? Right. I, I think that this uh, data ownership and, and fragment and an overall industry fragmentation make it very complex. But uh, um, Mark, if um, if you think about uh, the people who are just starting to embrace this overall AI um, conversational uh, automation, um, you know, probably text bots and you know chatbots and and all these fancy technologies. So, what would be the easiest entry point for them in this you know lucrative, pretty significant lucrative opportunity? Right. I I think that. Um... Uh, you know, the, the area of knowledge management and the ability to understand and serve up unstructured data is a very, very quick time to value. So for instance, at your uh, on property, um, you may have uh, FAQs about restaurants in the area, uh, events to go do, you can have an intelligent virtual agent, you know, via text, like, hey, I'm looking for, uh, you know, uh, you know, children under, you know, I need to entertain three children under 10 for dinner. What are your recommendations? Like you would to a, a human concierge. Artificial intelligence enables you to read in context, you know, what's your FAQs where you may have that and serve that back to the, to the, um, to the guest. And if it solves a problem, great. If the guest isn't getting satisfied via the intelligent virtual agent, maybe that gets escalated to the actual concierge. And then the AI tool still learns from that experience, right? But you now are beginning to capture a, a lot of information about, about that uh, user, right? Or about that, about that guest that you can leverage. And that's step one. And the idea, I think, is that... Um, uh, you can begin delivering value across the enterprise. You don't have to, you know, make a multi-million dollar investment to get real benefits. I think in today's, with today's technology, um, you're able to, to truly justify every, every expense that you make. And a lot of, uh, you know, if you, if you have over a hundred agents today and you're not thinking about how do I leverage artificial intelligence to better serve my customers, to make my agents happier, to onboard them faster, to keep them retained, um, then you're really missing the boat because, um, you know, we've seen across, you know, uh, 100 plus large enterprise clients, you know, self-service uh, usage increase 40% plus, right? Because we're able to learn, adjust, and then when you, when you solve a workflow, for an agent, you can just bring that over into your into your virtual agent um, uh, offering, and now those customers will be serviced there. Did that answer your question, Max? Absolutely, absolutely. Everybody's interested. How can I start? But uh, <laughs> listen, so it's been uh, almost forty-five minutes of uh, interesting conversation. I hope the audience finds that insightful and uh, um, actionable uh, for you. So thank you so much, Gianna Riera, uh, John Heimlich, uh, Mark Pulliam, and Stan Boyer for uh, joining the stage. And uh, we look forward to see you, all the precious audience, uh, on our uh, future webinars. So thank you so much. Stay tuned.